Choosing a name, especially for a business, is an important decision. It's your brand, after all. I used to do a radio show, and we had a regular feature on the show about shop names that are puns. To this day, years after I stopped doing that show, I still get sent emails and tweets about punny shop names on a very regular basis. I'm going to share one with you, not because I think it's a brilliant pun name, but because I enjoyed the reaction to it. Uh, it's a dog grooming parlour somewhere in America, and it is called Doggy Dog World. And that's OK as a name, that's OK. But on Twitter, someone had replied to it saying, Duh, this is not a pun. It's a doggy dog world out there is a well-known phrase. <laughs> My advice... If you're going to display your own ignorance that clearly, try not to start with the word duh. <laughs> but this is one of the things that Twitter is brilliant for. Twitter is basically a wonderful repository of the English language as it is used today. If you want to know if a phrase has got a foothold in the lexicon, just search for it on Twitter, and if you can find people using it there, then yes, it exists. It is out there in the wild. So I searched for Doggy Dog World to see if this was a one-off or not, and it is not. It's a Doggy Dog World out here, man. Don't get it twisted and keep you head up. <laughs> doggy Dog World, you eat or you starve. Listen, it's a doggy dog world. Eat or get eight. I'm always looking for my next victim. I don't trust you, mothers. <laughs> <laughs> and how do two of them know it's about getting eaten or eating and not know that it's dog eat dog? <laughs> there are loads of these phrases out there. For example, if only, alas, they made critics like Owen Shearer and their elk looked good and right. <laughs> Injuries, yes, but lacked bottle. And... Probably he represented the rights of the royalty and their elk, yeah. yeah. The royals, they love their elks, they really do. That's why the queen and her elk in this example, yeah. I think power and the elk go together, yeah. Hitler and Assad and their elk, yeah. Imagine Hitler and Assad sharing an elk. <laughs> and a platform. And my favourite of this particular genre, can't stand Mock the Week. Just another chance for Dave Gorman and his elk to show off. <laughs> Which... Which is confusing. Which is confusing to me for a couple of reasons. <laughs> Firstly, I have never been on Mock the Week. <laughs> never, never done it. Secondly, my elk is not a show-off. As elks go, he is very shy. If you're interested, I have got a photo of my elk. Look at him there, he is a magnificent, <laughs> magnificent beast. He loves a game of frisbee, like I say. Oh, he really, he really loves a game of frisbee. Ah, oh, good catch, Brooks, good catch, yeah. Now, this person, the one who thinks that I've got an elk, followed up their tweet with more commentary on my non-existent Mock the Week appearances. <laughs> I mean, whatever the story, he just wheels out the same old cat phrase. <laughs> <laughs> it's a twofer! We've got elk and cat phrase. <laughs> Obviously, he means catchphrase, but I haven't even got a catchphrase, have I? What haven't I got? <laughs> What's even weirder is he thinks he knows who I am and what my catchphrase is. Maths. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of catchphrase would that be? A benefit of the doubt, maybe it's a typo. So I searched Twitter and sure enough, it is out there. I'm pretty sure using another people's material or using their catchphrase isn't being a fan, that's being a theif. Yeah. <laughs> Skyfall is reassuring me that Daniel Craig is the coolest James Bond of all time. Just wish he had a killer cat phrase. <laughs> if you're looking for a cat phrase in the Bond universe, surely it's got to be Blofeld who's got the cat phrase, surely. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bred and I'm going to help you in your quest. We just need a logo and a cat phrase. <laughs> I think if I had a cat phrase, it would go something like, keep yo calm, cool. <laughs> That's worse than maths. <laughs> Seeing that so many people actually think the word is catphrase has inspired me. I have invented a little TV game show that I'm calling... <laughs> catphrase! <laughs> it's got a little cartoon character in it. We call him Mr Roast Potato. You see, it's um, <laughs> nothing, nothing like any other show. Uh, now, I've, what I've done is I've made some cartoon graphics that depict a well-known catphrase. <laughs> and, and when I say a well-known catphrase, I mean something that's a bit like a catchphrase, only wrong. <laughs> and we're going to reveal squares from the grid and see if we can guess 
the hidden phrase behind the cat phrase grid. What we need is a, a couple of people to play a game of cat phrase. I'm looking at the second row. Uh, <laughs> sir, you, you just met my eye. You, we both felt it, didn't we, at that moment? <laughs> you, what's your name there, sir? Uh, Andrew. Andrew. Andrew, would you like to play cat phrase? Yes, I would. You can stay exactly where you are. Oh, and I'll tell you what, lady next to you, what's your name there? Uh, Charlotte. Name? Charlotte, would you like to play cat phrase as well? Yeah. Uh, so, Charlotte and Andrew. You're playing cat phrase, okay? Because I, I spoke to you first, Andrew, you can have the first dibs on our first cat phrase. Let's take a square away. What have you got to work with there, Andrew? <laughs> There's not a lot of information there, is there? We've got... You can see it's Mr Roast Potato. Say what you see. Yeah. <laughs> it's nothing to do with cats. I promise oh, it's nothing right. to do with cats. I'll take another square away and we'll give Charlotte a go. There it goes. Oh, you've got a lot more information now, Charlotte. What, what can you see on the screen there? Lizard. A lizard, OK. Well, anything working with lizard and what could he be doing? No? Giving a present. Giving a present, OK. That's very good. We were working well, OK. Let's take another square away. You were absolutely right, Charlotte, but it's now passed to Andrew. Andrew, what are you, what are you seeing there? <laughs> I ran this by some friends earlier and one of them guessed gift as a newt, which I thought was pretty wonderful. <laughs> But it's not the right answer. It's not the right answer. You've not got anything in the locker, have you, for this, no, Andrew? Sure. OK, I'll take these away. That's a whole picture. I throw it to the floor. Anyone got any guesses? <laughs> Nobody at all. I think it's obvious when you see... It is obviously from the gecko, ladies and gentlemen. There you go. From, <laughs> from the gecko. There you go. That's how you play cat frames. From the gecko. You'd be amazed at the number of people out there who think that the phrase from the get-go is from the gecko. There's hundreds of them, they're all over the place. I tell it how it is and keep it real from the gecko. <laughs> uh, there is debate. They might mean from the ghetto, but I'm pretty sure they mean from the get-go. Right from the gecko, I will raise kids who are aware of the cause and effects of all elements of reality. I think there are a few things your kids are going to be unaware of, <laughs> to be honest with you. In a way, I understand how this has happened, because if you think about it, we all have phrases that we use that don't really mean what they say. We all say things like, knock the spots off or paint the town red, phrases that we use but don't really understand any literal explanation for their presence. So these people have heard get-go as gecko. Let's play another game of cat phrase, ladies and gentlemen. Let's pick another couple. Let's go over to this side. Uh, the man in the red, and, red, white and blue check shirt caught my attention on the third row. And the lady in the stripy orange and black. You've got to you be the, the pair for this. So let's uh, remove a square. We'll let ladies go first on this occasion. Let's remove a square and see what you've got to work with there. What are you seeing there, madam? Some sort of animal jumping. It is a sort of animal jumping. OK. Shall we remove another square and give the gentleman a go? Let's take that away. Oh, well, that could be a bit suspect. Um, <laughs> I'm hoping there'll be clarity when we take the centre squares away, but for now, have you got anything to work with there, sir? No. no. Nothing at all? OK, let's see what else we've got. Oh, there you go. <laughs> anything going on there? Well, it's definitely a goat. It is a goat. I'll take all the squares away and I'll throw it to the floor. Anyone like to have a little guess? A scapegoat. A scapegoat, you are 100% correct. It is, of course, a scapegoat, ladies and gentlemen. Congratulations over here. A scapegoat. Of course it is. And as you can see... These people, they are using a scapegoat instead of scapegoat. They've just misunderstood that the word scapegoat is two words of scapegoat. That makes sense, in a way. I can't take any more of my mum's shit, always using me as an scapegoat for all the family's dirt, yeah? <laughs> that makes sense. But other people are using the word a scapegoat to mean escape. For example, this person up here. Drugs is a temporary escape. Goat. <laughs> he just means escape, doesn't he? Why is he saying goat? I'll tell you why he's saying goat. He's on drugs. <laughs> That's why he's saying goat. Music is my escape goat from life, Mo. I just forget everything. <laughs> yeah, including spelling. <laughs> so let's play a final game of catphrase, ladies and gentlemen. A final game of catphrase. Let's take another, another pair to play this game. We'll go to back to this side. Should we go just to the end of the row on the second row there? And we'll let, uh, we'll let the gentleman go. First. There's quite a lot there, actually. If you watch the whole thing as it moves, it gives you quite a lot of information. Should we take another square away? Let's see what we get. Oh, it's sort of... It's not, it hasn't really even doubled the information. It's the same information, I would say, on the screen. Anything going on there, madam? No. No? OK, let's see, what, see if we get a... set. We do, we get one of the centre squares. That was lucky. Sir, it's over to you. I think you've got the, the upper hand here. It's all there for you, really, if you think about it. Something to do with crockery. It is to do with crockery, yeah. Let's take all the squares away. And again, I think somebody might get this. He'll throw it to the floor, anyone? <laughs> Bowl in a china shop, exactly. Of course it is, yeah. My favourite, by some distance, a bowl in a china shop. This is incredible. The number of people who use bowl in a china shop is perplexing. It's absolutely remarkable. Those people, I'm literally the definition of bowl in a china shop. <laughs> I'm so effing clumsy 
and I'm like a bowl in a china shop whenever I come home wasted. They mean bull in a china shop. That's what they mean. They're using it to mean the same thing. Clumsy. But then other people, they've heard the phrase bull in a china shop, thought it was bowl in a china shop, but don't know what that means, and so they've invented their own meaning for that phrase. These people are all using it to describe sportsmen who are easily injured. They are using it as a synonym for fragile. For example, Derek Rose is that bowl in a china shop. You're just waiting for the next thing to break or tear with him. And then there are other people. They've heard the phrase bowl in a china shop and thought, yeah, a china shop, a thing that sells bowls. What would you expect to find in a china shop but a bowl? It represents mundanity. It represents the lack of surprise, which is why I think this person says Spanish class is as boring as a bowl in a china shop. <laughs> This is how language evolves and changes to mean different things. Now, when someone says, my dad is the very definition of the saying, a bowl in a china shop, we have no way of knowing what they bloody mean. We don't know if they mean their dad is fragile or boring or clumsy. Not that it matters, he's no longer invited to my barbecue. Another one, this is incredible. My dad is so boring, he's like a bull in a china shop. <laughs> yes, bull. We've gone full circle now, haven't we? <laughs> What's happened here is that we've got the phrase bowl in a china shop, which means clumsy. But some people are hearing the phrase as bowl in a china shop, but they are using it in the same way to still mean clumsy. But then there's a third group of people who are hearing it as bowl in a china shop, and they're making sense of it by coming up with definitions of their own, such as fragile or boring. And we, who know the correct phrase, think that that is right, and that all of the others are wrong. But the truth is that their made-up definitions are completely legitimate. They're just as right as the original phrase, if you think about it. And doesn't the existence of this tweet suggest that maybe the original phrase was bowl in a china shop, which means boring, but she has misheard it as bull in a china shop, but is still using it in the same way to mean boring. In which case, how do we know that bowl in a china shop isn't the original phrase, and we're the people who misheard it as bull in a china shop, and we're the ones who have invented our own definition definition to be clumsy. Chicken and egg, we don't know who started it. <laughs> this stuff gets me quite worked up. It's like a red rag to a bowl for me. But <laughs> we have to go to a break now, ladies and gentlemen, but there is one thing I need to say before we do. Maths! <laughs>